All right, great to see a full room. Yeah, and we've got a great speaker for it too. Uh, we've got Dr. Rusty Toa. He is uh, he's a professor at Albany Christian University. He's the director of the Next Lab. This is like the, one of the premier research projects that is happening in the whole country, maybe the whole world around nuclear power. Okay, so this is I, I really a, a privilege to have him here. He graduated from Abilene Christian, uh, went on to University of Texas in uh, physics background, uh, served in the Navy, uh, even was an instructor for the Naval uh, Nuclear Power School, which is a rather prestigious school as well. And um, from there, I think he did a postdoc and he's, he's done a lot of work uh, since, but we're really excited to have him here to talk about this um, you know, really ambitious project uh, to bring a reactor to campus, sound familiar, right? Um, and uh, and they're, they're trying to do it as well. And there's nothing like trying to do it to really see what needs to be done. And so we're very lucky to have him here. Um, please, Dr. Toho. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be with you today. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Um, I'm thrilled to see a full room. Um, Eric spilled the beans on you. He told me that you're all required to be here. So I understand you're not here to see me, but you're trying to satisfy some requirement. Uh, um, hopefully it won't be uh, as bad as that sounded. Uh, Building the next university uh, research advanced reactor. I, I, I just want to say a few things there. Um, and I think most importantly, from the very beginning, I want to say that I, I see that the effort that's happening here to build a, a reactor on campus and the effort where we have at ACU as being complementary. There, by no means is there is there a, a is there a competitive nature with a winner and loser in this. I think that both projects have a lot to offer. Both projects have the opportunity to help advance taking nuclear power and deploying it to the world. Uh, slightly different paths, but with, uh, with the same end result. And so um, I, I'm, I'm thankful so much for the time that I got to spend today in, in your labs and, and, and visiting with the faculty here and learning. Um, and I, I hope that we can uh, ex exchange that same sort of courtesy. Uh, sure, I'll a shot. Uh, yeah. I'm from Texas. I've got an anti mask, so I thought I would. <laughs> you know, let's go. Sorry. Any this one? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Yeah. All right. Everyone's safe now. Um, yeah, I probably said too much. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, do I need to admit? All right. Um, next, uh, okay. Next stands for nuclear energy experimental testing. That's just the, the name we gave for our lab. Um, nuclear energy, obviously, there's value to that and importance there in terms of the energy density and the the, the, the value of that as an energy supply of the world. Uh, experimental testing. Uh, we wanted to do things where we could actually get our hands on the lab and do it. We wanted to go from uh, paper model reactors to actually testing and advancing the technical readiness level of it. But we wanted to address the, the world's critical needs. Um, how has nuclear energy addressed the world's critical needs? What are they? They're um, things that uh, you're probably familiar with, but I think it's important for us to remember why we're doing what we're doing. Um, the world needs energy. Um, this is a, an image of a, a lady in India. Um, first time I was in India at a physics conference, um, I saw all these little round discs setting along the side of the road, just mile after mile of these little discs uh, along the side of the road. I had no clue what they were. Uh, they're manure mixed with uh, straw set in the sun, and that is the energy source. An energy source of not just this lady, but way too many people around the world. Uh, something like 30% uh, of the world population still use uh, wood or animal dung or something like that as their primary energy source. So they take it into their home and they use it to cook their food with, to warm their home. And of course they breathe this and that leads to millions of deaths every year from, from lung problems. And so this is a problem. And of course there's a simple solution to it. If we just provide electricity to these people, their standard of living would change dramatically. There's a 2018 MIT study that said the future of nuclear energy in a carbon constrained world. Um, this graph, I like this graph because it talks about how the human development index, this is standard living, okay? We enjoy, we're comfortable high, we're, we don't enjoy living at a low uh, human development index. And so all it takes to move us to, a, to an advanced, uh, to a, a higher quality of living 
is to have a really a very modest amount of electricity. Um, if we have electricity, we can heat our homes. We don't have to burn wood in our homes. We can pump water into our homes so we don't have to drink water that we collect in the yard. There's all sorts of things we can do that expand, that increase our education, improves our health care, in general, raises our standard of living. The other sort of critical need is uh, cancer. A um, lot of different studies out there. This study says one in two people will develop cancer in their lifetime. Um, that means what? That means, I don't know, this side of the classroom, right? Don't want to be on that side. If you're on this side, you're, no. I mean, every one of us has been touched by cancer and we know how deadly it is. If we live long enough, doctors say we'll all get cancer. And so what do we need? We need something. Uh, there's a beautiful solution, targeted alpha therapy. This is one tr medical trial. Um, so this is dark stuff in the body is bad. Uh, PSA levels high is bad. This person right here was given all sorts of traditional treatments and PSA levels continued to go up, was given experimental beta therapy. So there between an alpha and a beta in a, part, in a body is a beta particle is very light and penetrates a lot of living cells, hundreds of cells, penetration range, An alpha particle has a range of a cell or two. And so if you can treat a body not with beta therapy, but with alpha therapy, you get huge differences. This experimental beta therapy, the cancer continued to spread, PSA levels continued to go up, this patient was terminally ill with a life expectancy of a couple months. Was used targeted alpha therapy. PSA levels dropped way down. A lot of the blacks gone. After a third treatment, PSA levels below detectable limits. And the cancer, which was distributed through the body, is gone. And so this is a case where it went from terminally ill with a life expectancy of a few months to being cancer-free because of targeted alpha therapy. You take an alpha emitter, you attach it to antibody, the antibody goes and attaches to a cancer cell, the alpha emitter decays, emits a, uh, an alpha particle, it travels into the cancer cell, kills it, it has enough energy to break the, the uh, DNA strand due to double strand breakage damage so it can't repair itself, and that essentially kills the, the cancer cell without penetrating into the healthy tissue beyond it. And so what's the problem? This, this method that, oops, this method that doctors are described as sort of smart bombs for cancer cells, right? Not blanket bombing, carpet bombing, but going in and kill, killing individual cancer cells. What's the problem with this? The problem of all this is it depends upon an availability of alpha emitters. So we need alpha emitters. When I'm talking to most of the, of the world public, I always stop at this point and say, where are alpha emitters found, right? They have a, a half-life of hours or days, most of them. Uh, especially the ones that want to be used by doctors and patients, they're found like in supernovas and the core of reactors. That's the only two places these things are produced. And neither one of them is it possible to get them from that location into a doctor's hands in a, in a period of a few days or something. And so um, there's a, a few alpha emitters being produced by stockpiles of old fuel, um, but uh, they're very, very limited. And so every one of these promising studies that show great promise, they end with this, but where do we get the alpha emitters from? So we have a need for alpha emitters. And the third need I'll just think about is a need for water. Um, something like 10% uh, of the world doesn't have clean water to drink, but much more than that, something like a third of the world needs water for sanitation and, and things we usually use water for every day. So big three needs of the world that, uh, that we can address, the critical needs of the world, uh, energy to end poverty, that's half of the world's population needs their standard of living raised by having uh, access to clean energy. Medical isotopes, half of us over our expected lifetimes will develop cancer and something like a third of the world population is in need of, of pure water. So these are not a few things. These are not, these are not simple conveniences. This is not adding wheels to your suitcase so it's easier to go through the airport, right? These are things that change the standard of living or change the living conditions of billions of people around the world. And so these are, these are big lofty goals. So what's the solution to this? The solution to this is, uh, in my opinion, a molten salt reactor, and I'm not, maybe I should have, for the audience, I should probably say advanced reactors. So let's, let's back up and let's be less offensive there. But I do wanna share with you a little bit about why Molten salt reactors is the reactors that we, we chose the technology for at ACU. Um, advanced reactors, uh, currently, if you look at the statistics, 
The safest form of energy is nuclear power. The amount of energy you get per death, if you want to be that crude about it, but how else do you talk about safety of it? The safest form of energy we have is nuclear power. But we're also basing that on technology that was developed 50, 60, 70 years ago. So if we can use advanced reactors, we can actually make them safer than they are today. So we take the safest form of energy and we can make it safer. Clean. It's actually the cleanest form of energy. I know everyone's worried about where we store the radioactive material, but you understand the quantity that's made and the ability to, to, to store it. We can also make them cleaner and produce less waste with advanced reactors. Again, let's not use, we, we wouldn't use 70 year old technology anywhere else in our life, right? None of you are using a 70 year old technology phone, right? Or a 70 year old technology car or bicycle or for that matter, jacket, right? I mean, you, we, we use new technology and we use it for a reason, right? It is safer, it is cleaner. And so there's no reason why we can't use um, new technology or, or advances technology. Uh, efficiency, uh, I'll talk more about that later, but we can be more efficient and more efficient in many ways. The more efficient in how much energy we produce per amount of heat, more efficient in terms of the, how much energy we get out of the fuel we use uh, per mass, et cetera. Uh, multifunctional, current uh, reactors do one thing, they produce electricity. Uh, new advanced reactors can produce medical isotopes, produce high process heat, produce electricity. So they can do a lot of things for us. Scalable, to make it economical, current reactors have to be built huge. A lot of reasons for that. We have a huge containment dome. We need to be able to, to protect the, the population. We need to have a huge containment dome to make that uh, billions of dollars in concrete and steel investment worthwhile. We have to make a lot of electricity. We have to make it huge. But with new advanced technologies, we can make small reactors. So we can put a reactor on a campus, or we can put a reactor at a, a, a remote uh, village uh, in Alaska, or a lot of, of, we can target the size for the need. Carbon free, of course, uh, nuclear power is carbon free and reliable. Uh, in the state of Texas, last February, we had an event uh, sort of like what you guys had this last week, but um, a bunch of snow and ice hit us. Our power grid went offline and there was millions of people without power for multiple days. And, uh, and we all of a sudden realized reliability is something we like in our electric power. We like the ability when we flip the switch on the wall, the lights to go on, or more importantly, the heat to go on for the water to be pumped into our homes. And when we lose that, the reliability in electric grid, all of a sudden the, our life shuts down. And so all these are things that we can get from um, advanced reactors. As we were thinking about what re advanced reactor was right for an ACU, we looked at a few different things. We came out with sort of two key requirements. And so I'll share with you some of our thinking through and why we made our technology choices. The first technology choice we made was we wanted to use a molten salt for coolant. And so um, when I think of salt, the first thing that comes to my mind is the Morton table salt, uh, very familiar white salt. Um, how many of you have ever seen sodium chloride in liquid state? All right. A few. Um, it turns out when you get it up to 850 degrees or something like that, it melts and it's warm enough that it starts glowing red. And it doesn't look nice and white anymore. Um, but if you just boil it and boil it, if you just melt it in a pot um, and then allow it to come back down to room room temperature, it doesn't look white anymore. Um, this is a lot of still uh, rusted inside of, of that uh, salt uh, because in the atmosphere, it corrodes pretty quick. So that's our pillar of salt that we have in our lab to, to demonstrate what salt looks like when you uh, melt it in a pot and bring it back to room temperature. But of course, we're not using sodium chloride for our salt in our reactor. We're using a eutectic mixture. One of the cool things about the salts, right, is that if you take a, a right mixture, this is an example for uh, Blinac, so lithium fluoride, sodium fluoride, potassium fluoride, each have a, a melting point of 800, 900, 800 degrees plus. But if you get the right mixture, you can get a melting point that uh, is something like 450 degrees centigrade. And so we take advantage of that to give us a, a material that has a melting temperature that's lower. And Blinac, um, you raise the temperature, it then flows and looks a lot like water. All right, so molten salt is our coolant. The other advantage of having molten salt as our coolant is we're not, uh, we're not limited to uh, a few hundred degrees like pressurized water reactors and using water as our coolant. As soon as water wants to get above 100 degrees centigrade, it wants to do a phase transition. So we have to have high pressure. 
And that brings in all sorts of, of dangers and hazards in itself and expenses to mitigate against it. But um, if we use the molten salts as our coolant, then we can operate much higher temperatures. So this graph um, says if we can operate up closer to 700 degrees, then we can, with just this one change, with just changing the outlet temperature of the heat transfer fluid from 300 degrees to 700 degrees, we can actually get 50% more electricity out of the same amount of heat, right? This is basic physics, Carnot cycle, heat transfer, but that just means that we're more efficient. And so let's operate a higher temperature so we can produce more electricity for the same amount of energy that we produce, same amount of heat, if we can, if we can work at higher temperatures. This also allowing us to, to work at higher temperatures opens the door to a lot of industrial processes. So things like um, petroleum refineries, um, metal refineries, uh, synthetic fuel productions, um, desalinating water. There's, there's lots of applications where if you have high temperature, you can actually very efficiently produce these industrial processes. And so having a higher temperature allows us to open the door to a lot of those processes. We talk about water, pure water, or desalinating water. That's certainly an option we have, um, but there's a lot of other things that are, are available to us in addition to the ability to produce water. Um, it also makes it safe. And if we're working with salt as our heat transfer fluid, we don't have to worry about that phase transition, which means we don't have to worry about the high pressure, which means we don't have to worry about Fukushima happening to us again. The, the, the lack of concern of your coolant when you do a phase transition into a gas um, just simplifies our life a lot. And so we can build a reactor that is walk away safe because having molten salt as a coolant also enables us to use liquid fuel. And so the second sort of design choice that we really wanted to focus on was a liquid fuel. Um, old solid fuel technology, man, I'm being more offensive than I intended. Um, there's some advantages to having liquid fuel. There's some advantages to having solid fuel. I, there's a place for both. What, what I, one of the things that I am excited about is the ability to get access to medical isotopes. Where are those medical isotopes? They're stuck inside the solid fuel behind the cladding. And the purpose of the cladding is to keep those fission fragments and capture uh, uh, radioisotopes inside of the cladding. And so obviously, if you're trying to get access to them, then you want the cladding to fail. And that's not what you want to have in a solid fuel reactor. And so old, old solid fuel technology, um, you, you burn a fraction of the fuel, and then you set the fuel aside, call it spent nuclear waste. Um, traditional, currently, 3 5%, something like that we use, and the rest we throw away. Uh, by using uh, liquid fuel, we're able to come up with uh, increased fuel utilization. You can essentially use 100% of your fuel. At the end of life decommissioning reactor, there'll be some fuel in it, but you can always take that to the next reactor. So you can essentially burn 100% of your fuel. If you use the fuel, then you're not taking the fuel and throwing it away and calling it waste. So you decrease the waste and increase your fuel utilization. You get to access the medical isotopes. And of course, if you don't have solid fuel to start with, you don't have to worry about a meltdown of solid fuel. I meant to say at the very beginning, I would love your questions as we go. That's better for me. It's probably better for you too. So let me just pause and ask for questions. Yes, Out of all the salts you could have picked, why did you pick the one you did? Yeah, so we, so the salt that we're going to use in our reactor is fly. And the reason we picked that is because that's what they did in the 1960s at the molten salt reactor experiment at Oak Ridge. And what we wanted to do is take the easiest path for the NRC to license us. Great question. Anything else? Other questions? Yes. But so um, by no means is fly the only salt. I mean, you, you need what do you need in a salt? Well, depending on whether you're running a thermal or a fast reactor, you need something either is pretty good moderator or not. Um, you want something that um, doesn't capture your neutrons, um, and you need something that's you know got high heat capacity, has a low melting temperature, uh, hopefully minimizes corrosion. You know, so there's all these properties you can think about, and certainly there's other salts out there. And looking forward, is it possible that there's a better salt than fly? Absolutely. 
Um, one of the problems with Glide is we need lithium in there. Lithium is fine as long as you pick the right isotope of lithium. You pick the wrong isotope of lithium, and then you end up producing a bunch of tritium, and so you have problems there. And so you need to you need to have um, you know enriched lithium. It's possible. Again, they did it in the '60s at Oak Ridge, but they use processes that are less um, environmentally friendly now. And so how can you do it? And there's no current domestic supply of enriched lithium to the high to the enrichment that we'd really like. And so um, maybe using a different salt that didn't depend upon the lithium enrichment would take that out of the you know supply chain problem. Yeah. I guess like how large or how like the thermal output of the reactor that you guys are trying to go for? Great question. We're, we're planning on going to one megawatt. Uh, the NRC says if you're liquid fueled research reactor, the highest power is one megawatt. And so we said, let's build one megawatt. We'll probably start it much lower and ramp up to it, but uh, that's sort of what we're allowed with this, these design choices to build. Great question. What, what's the lifetime of these reactors? So I, I think if you want to build a reactor, if you invest millions of dollars in something and you're going to sell electricity cheap enough that it actually is deployable to the poor around the world, you want the lifetime to be decades is the units. And is it three or four or five decades or eight decades long? You probably don't want the, the lifetime to be months. When our first reactor, we're not so worried about it. The, the goal of this first reactor we're building at ACU is not to have a reactor that sits there for uh, 80 years. What we would like is we'd like to prove that you can get a license, learn a bunch, and then move on to the next generation with improved materials, maybe better salts that will allow us to have longer lifetimes that's commercially deployable. So we have, we actually have a kind of an idea where we'd like to be able to prototype a reactor and drop it in a a test facility, turn it on, test it. Oh, this is no good. Throw it away and grab another one and try it again. And so we're building a facility that is reusable facility around a disposable core. And so our material choices and our choices, how can we move forward and get the reactor licensed and operational quickly? And if we have to sacrifice lifetime of the reactor, we're okay with that. So this first reactor might have a lifetime of five years or 10 years or something like that. And we're okay with that because again, our goal is not longevity for the first one. This kind of goes into, you might get to it in a couple slides so you can just wait if you will, but it goes with the like reactor lifetime and also the salt question. But um, what are you using for like the pressure vessel? Because I know that there were some issues with like that there were some experiments done that showed that maybe the lifetime of some metals around salts like it was pretty detrimental. Yeah, so materials is going to be a huge issue. Um, and and what we're going to use is we're going to use stainless steel 316 because we can get our hands on it and it's an approved material. The NRC understands what it's capable of doing and what its operating conditions are. Um, corrosion can be dramatically minimized with clean salt. And, and by clean salt, I'm really saying oxygen free salt. And so if we're very, very careful with getting the oxygen out of the salt to begin with, corrosion is way minimized. That the picture I showed you of the, the, the rusted pillar of salt, that was an open air pot. And, and, and that clearly would decay away in you know months perhaps or something, it would be horrible. Um, that, that's not acceptable, but if we can keep an oxygen free environment, then the chemical processes of corrosion are, are really, really minimal. Uh, so I know you said that this is um, a research reactor, so I think that's similar to almost like trigger mark two type reactors. Is there going to be like any secondary that you guys are building your facility, or are you going to just keep it all within a single loop and have kind of like full replaceability that you were talking about earlier? Right so um, I'll, I'll show you some pictures down the road. Our mindset is. Our goal is to license this thing. Our research questions are primary focused on what is inside the salt? How does the salt evolve? That shows us, does it pick up oxygen? Does it start to corrode? How does the fission fragments produced? Where do they go? Do they stay in the salt? Do they plate out in the metal? Do they bubble up as a gas? 
those are the questions that we really think those are the research questions we're focused on. So unlike the trigger market where they have uh, beam line, neutron beam line, or something like that, we're not worried about that. There's plenty of neutron sources out there. We're not trying to build another neutron source. We're trying to build a molten salt reactor and gain all the information from it that will allow us to make a second generation one that would be longer lifetime, commercially, more commercially viable. Uh, regarding the like research questions that you're trying to answer, do you already have like the chemistry models that you need for your salts, or is that one of the things that you need to just kind of run the reactor and then maybe develop new models? Um, nothing beats data, so it's great to have data. Um, no matter what data we get, if we change the design, it'd be nice to say, well, how is that going to change? So we love to have the models to go with it. So in my opinion, you need both. You've got to have the models. You can't verify the model without the data, but you'd like to have data validated models to help generate the second generation reactor. I appreciate the questions. These are a lot more important than any slides I've got. So keep them coming or fire them off. We'll still quit on time, right? I mean, 6.30, I'm out of here no matter what. <laughs> Hi, uh, I have a question as well. The NRC. Uh, so our status with the NRC, we're, we meet with the NRC, our product management area every two weeks. Um, we have submitted, we submitted 18 months ago, a regulatory engagement plan um, saying, this is our plan to, to send you documents in our path to do that. Um, we are this um, year, in, in the first half of this year, I'd say we're submitting a construction permit. Um, and so we're, we're following a two-part licensing where we submit a construction permit. And then we we build it and we submit an operating license to turn it on. And so our goal is to submit the construction permit this year. Um, our goal is to go critical in 2025. And by that, I mean December 31st at you know, 1130 at night. <laughs> we're to That's our goal. Uh, it's, it's aggressive, but we, and, and we want to be aggressive because we don't want to, we don't want to solve this problem in 40 years. But we also understand that when we say we're being aggressive, if it's if it's February of 26, I'm not going to say I was a failure or this project was a failure. I mean, I'm mean, still going to call it a success. But our goal and what we're pushing for is 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 rapid deployment. And so our design choices are what are easy for us to get and build, what's easy for the NRC to license. Is that? Yep. Thank you. Someone else had it. Yes. Okay. So uh, I, I'm not sure I got everything in your question. So I'm going to talk for a minute and then you, you try again, okay? Um, it's certainly going to be a radioactive environment. And one of the things that as we started calculating neutron fluxes around the reactor core, et cetera, one of the things we realized is that the, the edge of our reactor vessel is going to have a very, very high neutron flux, right? The radioactivity there, because unlike a water-cooled reactor that has that water shielding, we don't have that. And so even though we're building a thousand times smaller reactor um, than the commercial power plants, our neutron flux on the reactor vessel is similar. Um, and so that means we have to have shielding around the reactor core, um, obviously. Um, the other thing that's unique is that all the fissions, all the radiation doesn't primarily limit itself to the core because our fuel is being pumped around the coolant loop. So going through the pump and the heat exchanger will be fuel bearing salt. And so you'll have some delayed neutrons produced there. And so there's some radioactivity. So there'll be some enhanced uh, activation of other components. Um, internal shielding, understanding of the problem. Um, I, I, you know, I think that I think we can address those concerns, but it's something we have to be be cognizant of. Did I 
Answer your question or do you want to go again? At least I Um, I, I, so clearly you are moving fuel around. So if you're saying the piping through the primary loop yes. will be more radioactive than piping in a pressurized water reactor. I, I, I think that's probably true. Um, still, we're talking about the size and volume of this just because the capacity is higher, et cetera. I think you'll end up with smaller volumes of piping for the same size. And so I, I I don't think that over the lifetime of the reactor, you're going to end up producing significant different waste with this in terms of, of, of low level radioactive waste. I mean, power plants, steam generators have to be disposed of as radioactive waste currently. I think that'll be true of a molten salt reactor also. And I'm I'm not a nuclear engineer, so I don't have all the answers, but you know, this, this is one of the things I love about this project is that it's very, very, very interdisciplinary, right? I mean, I, I, I get to work every day with uh, engineers and chemists and, um, and physicists and computer scientists and mathematicians, and, and it's extremely interdisciplinary. And that's been really enriching for me, um, you know, for 15, 20 years, all I did was work with physicists. And as much as I like physicists, it's kind of nice to get out of your field and learn things. So, I, you know, this, this is a challenge that is going to take a, a team to, to solve. And, I, and I've enjoyed being part of a team to, to do that. All right, let me move forward to a few, few slides. So the mission of ACU's next lab is to provide global solutions to world need for energy, water, medical isotope, file, advanced technology, molten salt reactors, while educating future leaders in nuclear science engineering. This is a picture of our molten salt test loop. It's a molten salt system that's been operational for over three years. Um, we started this project in 2017 with a small group of people. We grew, um, we built this molten salt test loop. Um, this is what the loop looks like with no insulation around it. Of course, if you want to operate it at high temperatures, you need to insulate it. So this is a picture um, with insulation and heat trace around it at the top. The little bottom inset is an infrared image with the temperature scale on the right side. Um, I show you that just to orient you to the next picture. This is a nice little video. I hope works here. There we go. I, this is just a cool demonstration, especially for people who've never seen molten salt. This looks like water flowing out of our loop, but if you look at the temperature over here, it's, it's well elevated. Oops, sorry, that says 180 or something. It's a nitrate salt that melts at 130-ish degrees centigrade. So this is a low temperature salt. Um, again, this demonstrates one of the inherent safety features of using molten salt as your coolant. If there's a leak in the pipe, what happens? The salt flows to the ground, it drops, it spreads out, it cools down slowly over time, and look, that drop doesn't even drift because it freezes right there. So if it's a slow leak, it'll self-heal itself. And finally, if you have a bunch of crud in your salt, like radioactive crud that you don't want to dump in the world, it stays buried in the salt. So it captures its own waste as it, as it happens. So this is a nice safety feature of the, of the, of the molten salt reactors. Um, we don't need to watch it twice. Uh, a little history how we got here. In 2018, we had this uh, molten salt test loop. Um, the Department of Energy, uh, anyone, Ed McGinnis came out and, and looked at our loop and he, he saw our vision. Hey, we'd like to develop the technology to bless the world. Um, and he saw our loop and he said, we'd like to hear about how you're going to get from a little test loop to your vision for the world. Would you come and tell the rest of the Department of Energy team in D.C.? So in January, uh, the president of Allen Christian University, President Schubert, uh, the, the, the funder of this research, uh, Doug Robson and I, myself, we went to the Department of Energy and we said, we'd like to build a molten salt research reactor on the ACU campus. What we'd like to do is we'd like to build that. We understand the technology. It was done in the 60s, it's not a challenge, but what we can't do is we can't get there without your help. We need your help. We need you to commit to giving us the fuel. The, the research reactor infrastructure program is there. It's, it's, it's uh, designed to provide fuel to research reactors at universities, but they've never applied that to a molten salt reactor. And so we asked the question, 
does it work for our molten salt reactor? Will you provide fuel for us? And they said, yes. We said, can you give it that to us in writing? And they said, yes. And most of a year later, they came back with a letter and said, hey, we will provide you fuel for this. We like what you're doing. And so that sort of kicked us off. That kicked us off in a more formal way. We've been working with faculty from Texas, University of Texas, Texas a and Georgia Tech, but we took it to a new level. Uh, Natura Resources was stood up. Natura Resources is the company that is funding our work. Um, originally, uh, the, the founder of Natura Resources sponsored this work with a $3 million uh, donation from his foundation. Um, after we talked to Department of Energy, he stood up Natura Resources which has signed a $30.5 million sponsored research agreements with these four universities. And so together, the next research alliance or next year was formed. Um, we've been working now for several years, um, uh, focused on this reactor. This was a fall uh, workshop we hosted at ACU, despite the fact that last March, ACU beat University of Texas in the March Madness. Um, um, we still collaborate together very, very well. Um, and uh, we really are thankful for this uh, collaboration. Um, we, we do, um, each university brings their own strengths. Obviously, the University of Texas and Texas A&M have large nuclear engineering programs with their own research reactors, and so they have a lot to teach us. Uh, Georgia Tech has a robust program um, led by uh, Illinois alumni, uh, and so that program has a lot to offer to us in terms of calculations and design of our reactor. What does Abilene Christian University that doesn't even have a nuclear engineering degree have to offer? Well, we have experience with mol working with molten salt and experience in the lab. Going back to the very beginning of what does NEXT stand for, experimental testing, we wanted to do things in the lab where we could build them and test them and involve our undergraduate students. And so all these up here are different research projects that are happening on the ACU campus and that are helping us advance the technical readiness level of this project. So we have the molten salt test loop. It's about a five gallon system that uses a low melting point salt. Um, and that was our first uh, molten salt system. And we made lots of mistakes or learned a lot from building it. Uh, our second higher temperature fluoride salt, it, this operates up to about 350 degrees centigrade. This system will operate up to 725 degrees centigrade. Both of these about five gallons of salt. Uh, this system is about two months away from being commissioning. Our next system will be a 10 times bigger, about 50 gallons of salt. And this system will integrate a salt purification system with it. We're working on a small scale salt purification. How do you get the, the oxygen out of the salt in a glove box today? But we're gonna build a large 50 gallon size system to pair with this molten salt system. This will be a system that hopefully is clean salt and minimizes corrosion. Whereas these first two systems, we just put salt in and we try our best, but we understand there's gonna be oxygen in there. Um, how do we get the isotopes out? If we're gonna produce medical isotopes, how do we get them out? How do we get the impurities out of our salt that's gonna make it dirty? That's the isotope extraction purification team, the chemical analysis system. This is the team that's answering the question, what are the impurities in your salt and how they build up over time? So these are mostly chemical processes. These are mostly engineering processes, uh, instrumentation, turns out that it's very hard to buy simple things. If I was building a water loop, I could go to Lowe's or Home Depot and I could buy everything I need. Pumps, valves, flanges, flow meters, sensors, et cetera. If you're working with 700 degrees salt, you can't buy anything. So one of the first things we did was develop a, a flow meter that worked at high temperature. But we're also developing other components like a connector, a flange that will mate and disconnect. Um, we are working on the data acquisition for every one of these systems. We have an NEUP grant that's working on a filter for molten salts. And all of this, every one of these projects, is pointing towards our molten salt research reactor, the actual reactor that we want to build. Um, everything with a star is something where we've captured IP, either a patent or a patent pending. So our molten salt reactor experiment is a molten salt reactor experiment is pictured here. That's the Oak Ridge. 1965, 1969 uh, operating reactor. Our molten salt research reactor is modeled after that with basically three simplified assumptions. We're not gonna use high enriched uranium because that's the problem. We're not going to um, strive for as high a power density. So we're actually shooting about an order of magnitude smaller in power density. And our reactor doesn't require cooling 
water inside the containment, which was their maximum hypothetical accident is what happens if they have a salt water mixture inside enclosed. So the, uh, the bottom is their layout. Here's their reactor core, their primary enclosure. Their, here's the reactor core inside of their primary enclosure, a uh, pump and a heat exchanger to a secondary heat exchanger, fuel handling on the left. Very similar layout what we have, fuel handling. Here's our reactor core. Here's a secondary, uh, a secondary salt loop. We're going to build this. Like I said, our goal is to uh, to build a facility that's reusable, and we can drop in a prototype. And if we use it and learn, we drop in a second prototype. We don't have to throw away the building. And so ACU has designed the Science Engineering Research Center. Very generic sounding thing, so people don't know that there's a research reactor inside of it. But it's 28,000 square foot facility, um, 6,000 square foot research bay, some specialty labs. Design was completed last year. We hope to break ground next month and complete it next year. This is sort of a big picture, picture of what it looks like on the outside, but this is my favorite picture. This shows what's really special about the, the building. There's some radio chemistry labs, some salt loop labs, some Instrumentation labs are on the side and some offices, but those are boring. This is the exciting thing. What makes it special and unique? Well, um, we've got this ditch, okay? If you have salt, that if something goes wrong, it falls to the bottom, then let's just build a ditch. We'll take advantage of a lot of natural shielding around it. All we have to do is put a concrete lid on top of it, and we've got ourselves a place to build a reactor, try it, we can change it out, modify it. Big crane at the top. Let me see, I got some pictures here, some numbers. So for sizes, the room is 50 by 120. It's very tall, the 40 ton crane on the top, but the ditch is 80 foot long, 15 feet wide and 25 feet deep. And that gives us a spot where we can take our little reactor, drop it inside of here, put a concrete lid on the top of it, and we have a place where we can operate a reactor. All right, let me pause for questions. Yeah. Who's actually manufacturing this? Like, is it, are you, are you, uh, do you contact out to a vendor or are you building yeah. a lot of this stuff? So ultra center? safe nuclear, no. <laughs> 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 um, we do not have an ultra safe nuclear partner. We are, we are actively um, engaging. I mean, actively like today, emails going back and forth with a variety of large engineering firms saying, who would be interested in partnering with us? We are designing this thing. And again, we're designing it based upon a 1960 design. So we're not reinventing the wheel, but still someone has to make AutoCADs of every part and manufacture every part. And so we're in the process of, of uh, engaging large engineering firms to, to look for a EPC contractor to work with us. Is the idea that it'll be assembled on site or you will actually just physically drop it in? Uh, pretty much broad, the one to be determined, okay. but I would assume we would arrive on campus and very big pieces to be dropped in. Large. Okay. How much of this reactor design do you intend to be, I guess, plug and play for lack of a better word? Like, do you intend to, like, when you remove your reactor and put in a new one, are you making the primary loops and like other heating and cooling loops, processing loops, are you making those generic so that a new reactor can come in? And connect to those same ones, or are you taking everything out when you take out your reactor? So, I, we would like them to be generic, but we understand we're, we are we're designing one reactor today. We we built we we plan to build a facility we believe that will outlive the reactor. The the sort of twenty million dollar investment by the university here we want it to be not a disposable cost, and so this. This facility we would like to be reusable. Yes, if the fuel handling system or the secondary, you know, coolant loop could be reused, I think we're happy with that. But um, we're really focused with getting that first reactor operational. So, good question. I don't have a good answer. That's what I should have said. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a control. Ah, uh, control room. Um, Sorry, we, we chopped, if we were to chop a little bit further out, it sits right here on this side. And uh, there's also um, in the building, there is a, um, a what, what could be a public foyer, um, stairways up to offices, 
Um, but then most of the labs in the, in the high bay would be would go to a control room, could control door. But there is a, what we're referring to as a training control room at the other end and this little wheel, window looks through. So that would be sort of, if you wanted to have a public uh, tour and you wanted to take a group of high school kids in, you could take them into a training room that would look just like the control room. Um, in fact, it could be used for, if, if this advanced reactor is a place where we want to bring in reactor operators and train them for advanced reactors or something, it'd be a place where we could do that that would not replace the, the operation. Could be a power generating reactor, or you just connecting the secondary loop point. So, our bio heat sinks the air. Um, and of course, you have problems with how much electricity you can produce and things like that. But yeah, our, our final heat sink here is just the air. So our plan is just to throw it away. Again, our thought of research reactor is in the beginning, we even though it's, it might be built for one megawatt, we'll probably barely turn it on and tickle it and watch the salt. And it'll be a very slow <clears throat> ramp up over a long time. And maybe we turn it on and turn it off and turn it on and off and on and off. And if you turn it on and off, you're not generating power in camp. Uh, since you're kind of talking about this uh, limited lifespan, are there any design decisions now that you're making to hopefully make the decommissioning process easier? Oh, so we definitely have our eye on the decommissioning. And again, if this is all of your primary salt inside of one enclosure, then I think the decommissioning plan looks a lot like grabbing this with the 40 ton crane, pulling it out, putting it on a flatbed, and it drives off. But that salt with you know enriched uranium in it might go into the next reactor. And so uh, when it leaves, hopefully it leaves without the fuel bearing salt in it. Are you only planning on using solid filters or are you also looking at like gas charging for salt So all of the above. So that that uh, um, any UP filter grant looks at solid filters, mechanical, centered nickel stuff, but it also looks at some advanced techniques, which are sparging and, and some other interesting ideas to try to get the foam off the top and other things that the MSRE you know, had struggles with. And maybe even some, some other ideas, I and mean, again, ideas we're glad to, glad to visit. All right. Um, this is my outlook. I think the future for advanced reactors is very, very bright. I, I think what you guys are doing here is awesome, and, and, and I wish you all the success in the world, and, and we're, we're certainly cheering for you from Texas. I think that for me, when I started this journey four or five years ago, I had this idea of, wow, wouldn't it be great to bless the world with this sort of technology? Um, honestly, I didn't know how we were going to get there. To today, I believe there's a path to get us from where we are to that deployed technology where the world can be better because of this. And so I, I really think that our goals are achievable. I think they're gonna change our universities. I think they'll change our country. I think they'll change the world. And, and because of that, I, I really appreciate our sponsor, Natura Resources. I appreciate y'all's attention. And these are other people that have supported uh, the project. I think I got two minutes for questions before I have to let you go. Yes, sir. It's going to be a little bit involved, but uh, are you or have you guys uh, have anybody from anyone who's still working on a boss cooling simulation? I know you guys have said they have it in a massive dish, right? I'm not super familiar with MSR's technology, but if you have a liquid fuel and whatnot, I guess how is it moderated or cooled down during boss cooling situations, or if you have people working on that? Yeah, so, so we do. We obviously have a team that's working on accident scenarios. What are the accidents? And, and so you know, the, the, the short answer for how a molten salt reactor, how you shut it down and make sure it's safe is you have a core where you have, in our case, it's a thermal reactor. So we have a core filled with graphite. Oh. And so as soon as we drain it out of that core and out of the, you know, move, remove the fuel from the, from the moderator, then it shuts itself down. So then how do you remove the heat? Well, it's just low enough power that passive cooling of that drain tank is sufficient in, lo in complete loss of power. Okay. So this, this reactor will not require any sort of active backup power or cooling system. Just natural, uh, natural uh, cooling will be sufficient in a in a complete loss of power um, or loss of coolant. Loss of coolant if it, if it spills in the secondary enclosure, the same thing happens. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Question: Are you also thinking about keeping it hidden, right? Or reusing the motor or even the 
liquid if you're on. Uh, so what happens if the salt freezes in the core? Yeah. Is that, yeah. 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 So yeah. so we, we 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 had a great discussion, a multiple discussion on this, right? Because if it if the salt freezes in the core and becomes more dense in a moderate thing, then obviously it's going to go critical. Well, if it goes critical, well then it's going to melt the salt, um, and it, so anyhow, so um, there, there, um, there, there was proposed this question of what happens if you somehow if you prevent it from draining from the core, would it sit there and go critical and uncritical? It's going to bounce back and forth forever, um, you know, melt and freeze, melt and freeze, um, and so is that our worst case scenario? Is when drain plug from the core is blocked? And so is that worse than all the salt leaking out, all the salt being stuck in? And so we were, we're having this discussion internally and we have calculations, of course, and, and folks, and that's really where we're leaning on our university partners and their nuclear engineering uh, you know, expertise, because they obviously have the simulations and the code to be able to help us. Would any of these two scenarios affect the population? Would any of these two scenarios affect the population? No. Yeah. So, um, what would what how could you imagine something that would affect the public the, the 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 scariest thing there is my scenario where the salt spilled on the floor and the secondary enclosure ruptures and so anything that would off gas from that and goes into the atmosphere that would be sort of the worst case and you would have to have a break primary secondary and then what and then what comes out of the, the salt as a gas that is radioactive and what are those? So that would be the sort of worst case scenario um, for that. Or if you actively sparge the salt to get gases out and you drive off some radioactive gases, then you have to obviously catch those and collect those. And so if the off gas system were to fail, that would be the, I think that's the only way where you actually get some sort of danger to the public. I'm cool. I don't, I'm looking at it. I'm <laughs> over, it's less than 10 till. Okay, all right. Let's take a couple more. Uh, how is the fuel salt produced? So um, we're, we're, we're gonna use Flive as the fuel salt, lithium enriched. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of it sitting in Oak Ridge right now. So we've asked the Department of Energy, can we have that? Okay. That's an easy first step. If we wanna make a third generation and we need lithium enriched there, then we have to figure out lithium enrichment. Like the salt mixture has a particular melting uh, point and uh, due to the combination of the mixture, right? Then it's also temperature different uh, from the UTEC to a figure, you can see that. So, so to have that melting point, you need to operate the reactor at one particular temperature. The temperature changes, the uh, UTEC point changes, or the melting point will also change. So, won't that be a problem because it is very difficult to operate at one particular temperature. So we're going to operate above the eutectic point is that melting point based upon your mixture. And obviously over the lifetime of the reactor, as fission products are added and you produce dirt, as you burn uranium and you remove some of the uranium uh, export out there, uh, you, you're going to change the salt content. And so the melting temperature of the salt will drift a little. And if that's 450, 454 and it shifts up to 460, we're, we're going to keep our operating temperature, you know, five, 20 above or something like that. We're, we're planning to operate between like 520 and 620. Yeah, I don't see the, I don't think there's a mechanism I'm aware of that would change the melting temperature by 80 degrees. Eight degrees, yes, 80, no. One more quick question. Is there one more quick question out there? Yeah. Uh, how was your public relations? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, we're thankful to be in Texas. Uh, it's going pretty well. I'll just point out this development corporation of Abilene. This is a city uh, economic stimulus group that takes some of our tax money and tries to reinvest it in the community. Twice they've reinvested in this project. Our original molten salt test loop, $300,000 came from DCOA and they pledged 3 million to our building. And so the city has embraced this project, is what I'd say. So I think it's going well. I don't want to take it for granted, but um, it's it's important. Public relations is important. All right, let's thank our speaker.